Welcome. I am Bill Brown, the Director of Innovative Evangelism for the Baltimore Washington Conference, and it is a joy to welcome our siblings from the Peninsula Delaware Conference and our siblings from the Baltimore Washington Conference as we gather tonight to hear a presentation on becoming a non-anxious leader. And there is nobody who I know in the connection who is more non-anxious, if that's an actual word, than my friend and colleague, Jack Shatama, who's joining us. Jack is the uh, director of the Center for Vital Leadership and the former executive director of Camp Pocomath in the Peninsula Delaware Conference. And it's a joy to have you with us tonight, Jack. Jack and I go back to our seminary days together, where I think I can remember Jack in some of our counseling classes really grasping onto this idea of the non-anxious leader, even at that point in his career. And so it's wonderful to see how that has evolved over the years. So welcome, Jack. And as we get started, I would love to open us up with a word of prayer. So would you pray with me, everyone? Holy and gracious God, send forth your spirit across this connection as we welcome people from around our region, from several states, two annual conferences, many districts. We give you thanks for gathering us at this time and in this place, particularly during this season when people are on edge. Anxiety is elevated, and yet we are still called to be your hands and feet in this world. And so guide us tonight, O oh God, as we learn how to be that non-anxious presence you have called us to be. Be with us as we prepare to enter the season of Lent, as we prepare to prepare, as we get ourselves ready for the great feast of Easter. Guide us with your spirit tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just as a reminder, we are recording tonight, and the recording and tonight's slides will be available uh, sometime later this week for both annual conferences. And if you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom uh, platform, and we will get to as many questions as we're able to get to tonight. So Jack, without further ado, I'm going to turn it all over to you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, it's uh, Bill and I go way back uh, to our days in seminary. And uh, as you mentioned in a previous training Tuesday, uh, we actually started and finished at the same time. We were in what was called the student pastor track and met weekly over that those four years. So uh, to, to come back and be able to work together some uh, 30 plus years later is quite a blessing. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to fire up uh, my slides here. Um, I first encountered this idea of a non-anxious presence when uh, we had our first pastoral counseling class, as Bill was referring to, which was our very first semester at Wesley Seminary. And the professor, Carol Saucy, uh, introduced us to a book called Generation to Generation, Family Process in Church and Synagogue. And uh, you would think, OK, well, that's, you know, about learning about your family and, um, you know, what makes you tick. But uh, the, the family process in church and synagogue was really helpful in understanding that a congregation is a family system of family systems and that understanding these uh, family systems uh, principles and dynamics can actually help you uh, to better understand what's going on as you are trying to lead change. It's become uh, really one of the most helpful things to me in my 30 plus years of ministry as a leader. And so that's why I want to share that with you. Uh, I want to let you know uh, at the uh, end of the uh, our time together, I'm going to provide a link to you. Uh, we are uh, going to be offering a free course that starts March 6. It'll be a four week course on um, that's it, entitled the Non Anxious Leader Family Systems Basics, and it's free to any members of the Peninsula Delaware or uh, Baltimore Washington conferences. That's clergy or lay members, and uh, so I'll give you some more details at the end and how you can register. So uh, what I have learned is that the key to effective leadership is the ability to be a non-anxious presence. And the best way that I can describe what a non-anxious presence is, is to describe what it's not. Uh, a non-anxious presence is not a non-anxious 
non-presence. A non-anxious non-presence is, is somebody who doesn't let things bother them. They just kind of roll off them. They're kind of laid back, but it's really because they're really not emotionally present. And when, when I say um, presence, I'm talking about emotional presence, not physical presence. Um, being a non-anxious non-presence was kind of my go-to. That's kind of, if you know, we all kind of have lean in a certain direction and that's the direction I tended to lean. I probably still do, but I work hard at not being a non-anxious non-presence. Uh, but it's easy to not get upset about things if you're not really emotionally engaged and emotionally connected. And sadly, um, I learned about this when I was a parent. We have four kids. The youngest is now 30, almost 31. But when they were growing up, um, <clears throat> they started calling me Jack. And it, it wasn't because we were like when I was growing up, it was the hippie families that called their parents by their first name. It wasn't like that. It was because uh, they uh, they would say to me, Dad, 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 and then finally Jack, and and then I would look up and and I realized that I wasn't engaging as a dad. I was physically present, but I wasn't engaging as a dad, and and so you you probably can tell already that I've got issues. But that's what a non anxious, not a uh, non anxious non presence is. At the other end of the spectrum is an anxious presence. An anxious present is somebody who's so emotionally connected that um, they can't help but kind of be in other people's stuff. They they got to make sure everybody's functioning right. They got to make sure everybody's taking their responsibilities seriously. And and so an anxious presence can't help but let their own anxiety kind of spill out onto others. And, and uh, you know, that's not really helpful either, right? Um, it, it, being around an anxious presence can actually make other people anxious. And so the idea is we want to be in the middle. We want to um, be this person who is able to um, present as non-anxious, um, to, to remain calm, but still be emotionally connected, still be emotionally present. And the one thing that's important to remember about being a non-anxious presence is you will feel anxious inside. It's not that you don't have anxiety. It's that you're able to regulate it. You're able to manage it in a way that doesn't make a challenging situation worse. And so that's that's the idea of being a non-anxious presence. It's not that you're going to get rid of anxiety, and 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 you, you're gonna. It's going to be challenging to you. But the more you work through this type of approach, uh, the better you will get at being able to regulate your own anxiety, so that you can present yourself as non-anxious. <clears throat> So some family systems basics in a real uh, quick kind of summary is um, they were each part of multiple re relationship systems. So your family of origin, which is your uh, the nuclear family you grew up in, but then your extended family, like your aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, uh, that is a relationship system. Uh, a congregation is a relationship system where, as I said, it's a, uh, an, <clears throat> a family system of made up of family systems because you not only have, have the members of the congregation, uh, the constituents, but then you have, they, they all kind of are connected to their own family of origins. And, and so it becomes a family system of family systems. And even an organization uh, like um, uh, our annual conference is, each annual conference is uh, a relationship system and denomination like the United Methodist Church is a relationship system. And and even our, our country is a relationship system. And so to the extent that we understand how relationship systems function, we can better navigate how we can lead change. And that's that's really the biggest reason to want to be a non-anxious leader is to be able to effectively lead change, especially in anxious times. And as Bill mentioned, uh, we are in an anxious time, uh, not just as a denomination where who, who knows what we're facing in terms of where churches will go and where people will end up. Uh, but also as a country, right? We're we're as divided as I've ever seen in my lifetime, and so that creates a lot of anxiety. Now, in every uh, system, there's a tension between being an individual, being a self, <laughs> and conforming to social norms. Um, the social norms are these things that uh, people agree to abide by, and um, it. They're, they can be good. Uh, they help create community. They are expectations um, that help create stability. And so um, in more traditional cultures, uh, social norms are stronger. Uh, and uh, But they are actually uh, 
uh, more stable cultures. They tend to be more stable cultures, but they can tend to kind of smother the individual. And, <laughs> and more individualistic societies like our own, um, social norms become less important because uh, well, we can't even agree on what's truth nowadays, right? Um, uh, but and so people have more individual freedom, but the society is not as stable. And so <clears throat> there's this tension uh, between individual individuality and social norms. And the way that social norms present themselves, especially in our families of origin and in our um, <clears throat> congregations, is uh, through what's called surrounding togetherness pressure. Surrounding together in this pressure are these expectations that we uh, conform <laughs> to certain ways of behaving. Uh, in, in families of origin, one of the best ways to understand that is holidays. How every family celebrates a holidays differently, especially um, like Christmas and New Year's. And every family uh, of origin celebrates birthdays differently. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I know some families where if you don't get a call on your birthday, they don't love you. I know other families where they don't even call on their birthday and everybody celebrates uh, the, all the birthdays for one month in, uh, on, this, on, this, on one day in the month. And, and then some families don't even celebrate uh, birthdays, not right or wrong, um, but they, they are norms that, that uh, kind of dictate how we're supposed to behave. In the church, if you've ever heard somebody say, we've never done it that way before, that's surrounding togetherness pressure. And churches are full of surrounding togetherness pressure as well because they are relationship systems. So another way to look at this is that this, there's this tension between what we call self-definition, um, that is the ability to, to know what you believe and to be able to express that in a healthy way, and between relationship and emotional connection because surrounding togetherness pressure is <laughs> the outcome of, of um, uh, relationship and emotional connection. It's the way communities are held together. But um, if, if, sur if surrounding togetherness pressure dictates, then a relationship system gets stuck. Um, and if self-definition dictates, then the relationship system really does not have a whole lot of connection. And so you, you're looking for a way to hold those two together. Now, th this is all to kind of set out the key principle uh, um, family systems theory, which is this idea of self-differentiation. And self-differentiation is not selfishness. It's not self-centeredness. Um, what it is, it's the ability to, to kind of express what really matters to you, your own goals and values in the midst of that surrounding togetherness pressure. So when everybody is telling you, you need to be at home for Christmas, and you say, you know, um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to my fiance's parents' house this Christmas. Um, that's that's self differentiating. You know, I I, I care about you, but um, I've decided I'm going to do this. Or when uh, you know your, your your family says, well, you know, you're gonna be a doctor. Um, well, you know, I decided that I want to be a social worker instead, or I've decided I decided I want to join the Peace Corps instead, or as in my case, I, they didn't want, say they wanted me to be a doctor, but I felt some pressure uh, because my family wasn't a Christian family. I felt surrounding together this pressure when I felt called to ministry. And so um, self-differentiation is the ability to stay connected to people, but being able to express yourself in a healthy way. And uh, Edwin Friedman, who wrote Generation to Generation, says that the hardest thing uh, to do is to be a self, to self-define um, while remaining connected. But if you can do this, if you can remain that non-anxious presence, if you can really remain uh, solid in your convictions while staying connected, especially to the most anxious, it creates this presence uh, that is essential to leadership because uh, you're staying present with people uh, even who uh, disagree with you. And so um, the, what does this look like? Um, the way I like to describe it is it's the ability to say what you believe while giving others the freedom to disagree. Because really, can you can you convince other people to agree with you anyway? If they don't, it's, it's a difficult task. And when you try to tell them to disagree with you, to agree with you, they usually push back. Um, so what a non-anxious leader is able to do is able is to be able to say what they believe. I believe this is where God is leading us. Um, you don't have to agree with me. It's okay. But I want you to know, uh, this is where I think we should we should be going. 
And people are attracted to this kind of presence because it, it demonstrates both self-definition, that personal conviction of where you believe God is leading, but it also creates emotional connection because you're, you're giving people the freedom to make their own example. Now, why is this important <clears throat> to, to make their own choice? Why is this important? Um, well, this is not my garage. This is a stock photo, but this is a, a this really represents kind of like what my garage looks like. Um, in fact, it's probably a little neater. And, and we have a detached two car garage, and you know, the, there's a rhythm to the way things go. We've lived there for a couple decades, and uh, you know, when I have stuff that I don't have room for in the house, I just take it out to the garage and I plop it down somewhere. And over time, it gets more crowded and more disorganized. And then every once in a while, uh, maybe once a year, uh, I'll just I'll take a Saturday and I'll just dive into it and I'll toss stuff out and I'll reorganize and I will, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make it look good again and usable. Uh, and then it starts to cycle all over again. Well, about 15 years ago, it was a Saturday morning. I didn't have anything on my schedule. I was doing dishes in the, in the kitchen. And I said to myself, today's the day. I'm going to clean the garage out. I've got all day. I'm going to do it. And then my wife walked by, and, and she wasn't even snarky. She, she just said, uh, you know, you need to clean out the garage. And all of a sudden, all my motivation disappeared. It was like to me, I was, I was saying to myself, now, I'm not going to do it now, because if I do it now, she's going to think I did it because she told me to do it. And it was my idea first. I mean, I, I really lost all my motivation, and I decided not to do the garage. And I told you I have issues. Uh, but what I what I've learned from that is that nobody likes to be told what to do. In fact, the research has shown when you tell somebody what to do, or when you tell somebody what to believe, or when you tell somebody they're wrong, they actually entrench, they push back, and they get firmer in their beliefs. So leadership is not about telling people what to do. It's not about convincing them to agree with you. It's not about convincing them that you're right and they're wrong. The more you try to do that as a leader, the more people will dig in and resist. And so we want to find a different way. We want to, if we're going to lead change in any relationship system, but especially in the church, and then we need to find a different way. And that different way, according to family systems theory, is leadership through self-differentiation. I, I should stop here too, because I could just go on. Um, if you have a question, please just drop it in the chat. Uh, uh, Bill will uh, let me know and I'll answer it right there. Okay. So we're going to use the Q&A. Don't okay. want to confuse people. Use the Q&A feature. And we're still waiting for our first question, Jack. So take a sip of water and carry on. Um, I know you are priming the pump, though. Okay. Well, we'll see. I mean, you know, it, if nobody cares, nobody cares. I'm trying to be self-differentiated. So anyway, um, so the idea of self-differentiation is that you as a leader, are you're prayerful, you're seeking God's will, you're trying to discern, and you're able to say, this is where I believe God is leading, whether this is leadership in the church or leadership in your own life. I believe God is calling me to do this, or this is really important to me. But as a leader, you understand that. And if you can express that in a healthy way while staying in touch with the rest of the people in uh, the congregation, in the system, um, especially the most resistant, especially the most anxious, um, then there is a good chance that the body will follow. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again. It's not easy um, because uh, there will be resistance and there will be people complaining. There will be people who are anxious. There will, there will be people who may even get disruptive. Uh, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to sidetrack you. They're trying to get you to go back to the way things were before. and and. The, the challenge then as a leader is to remain a non-anxious presence to say, I, this is what I believe. Um, I think this is where God is leading us. It's okay if you don't, if you don't agree, uh, but I believe this is where we're going to go. Um, and, and then, but then stay connected and show you care about the people who are most resistant. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, question for you, Jack. So particularly for in a, in a church system, and particularly for clergy, how do you deal with the anxious people who who think they can wait you out because they have waited through three other pastors before you? Right. So the quick answer is 
move closer to them emotionally. In other words, don't withdraw from them, don't separate with them, uh, but actually show that you care about them, even as you disagree with them about the direction of the church. Um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a quick answer. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, dig deeper into how that looks. Um, <clears throat> but I, it's a really good question because there are people who um, either will say, well, I've been through this before. I'll just wait till the next one. There are people who will leave and come back when the next one comes. Um, the most important thing that you can do is uh, let them know you still care about them, um, but they're not going to, uh, be, you know, they might convince you that you're wrong. That's okay. If you have an open mind, have an open mind. Um, <clears throat> but just by just by saying they're going to wait you out, um, you don't want to let that keep you from trying to move forward in the way you believe God is leading. And a lot of this is faith and trust, right? If we believe this is God, then um, this is not about us. This is about what God is doing, and God's grace will work in us and through us. And we ask God for God's grace to help us to show care and compassion and connection to the anxious, even when we don't give it. And that, uh, again, uh, that's a great segue. It's a great <laughs> uh, way to set up um, this idea that leadership uh, through definition is kind of finding the sweet spot between self-definition, this is where I believe God is leading, and emotional connection. I care about you even if we don't agree. And, and as I said, we'll get into that um, uh, uh, more deeply as we go through this, uh, uh, this session. So here's what um, leadership through uh, self-definition is. It's experienced by those uh, in the relationship system as authentic, authenticity and presence. And so the first thing is your point of view, your, your experience and where you come from matters and, and you respect the experience of others as well. And so that's really important that um, you, you can be a self while letting others be their, themselves as well. Um, <clears throat> the second part of that is vision. As leaders, your role is to always be thinking about where God is taking you. You know, you know leadership, I believe, um, inherently involves change because if, if you're leading, you're always looking to move to a better situation, to improve things, to get better at what you're doing and to be more effective. And, and if all you're doing is maintaining the status quo, then you're really just managing, you're not leading. And so leadership uh, vision is really about self-definition. It's about saying, this is where I believe God is leading. That involves vulnerability. To be to lead through self-differentiation, it, it makes you vulnerable to uh, attack. It makes you vulnerable to uh, criticism and to disruption and people trying to, to stop you in your tracks. Um, because it, it, when you are vulnerable, you have the courage to speak your truth um, and, and to do it in a humble way, to do it in a way that gives other people the freedom to disagree. Um, <clears throat> Brene Brown in her book, Daring Greatly, puts it this way. She says, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. And what she's doing is she's going at uh, directly at the cultural myth that vulnerability is weakness, that as leaders, we shouldn't be vulnerable. Um, and, and instead, she contends that it's the opposite. Edwin Friedman, in his book, A Failure of Nerve, says something the same <laughs> similarly when he says that leaders need to be willing to embrace vulnerability. They need to be willing to put themselves out there in a place where, you know, they know things might not work, but that's okay. They're, they're willing to try because they believe God is leading. And uh, they not only need to be able to embrace it, according to Friedman, but they need to learn to love it. In other words, uh, one of the things that I, I tell people that I mentor and coach is that when, as a leader, uh, you want to actually start to seek out that vulnerability, that place of discomfort where um, you, you, you start to love feeling like, you know what, I'm putting myself out there because God is leading me to do it. Humility, uh, just the, the, the willingness to say, this is this is what I believe. This is my interpretation. I may be wrong. You don't have to agree with me. Those are all things that uh, a non-anxious leader say that help you, you lead through self-differentiation. And then, of course, <clears throat> emotional connection. You, you have to have uh, both point of view and vision, the, the self-definition, and have the emotional connection. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so um, <clears throat> it's really important that we understand that leadership through self-differentiation 
is not about being right. It's not about um, <laughs> convincing others that we're right. It's about discerning what God's will is and then try to lead in that direction while staying connected to the, especially to the most resistant and anxious in the congregation, in the relationship system. Now, one thing that's important is that the, the higher the perceived stakes, um, the perceived emotional stakes, <clears throat> the harder it is to maintain a non-anxious presence. So um, it's easy to be a non-anxious presence when you're around acquaintances or people that, you know, you're not really emotionally connected to, you're not, you don't really have a deep, a deep sense of uh, connection or care for. Um, much harder in your own family of origin um, when, you know, somebody tells you uh, that you, you should, you should be, be doing what they want or you shouldn't be doing what they don't want. Or in a congregation when they say, well, we can't do that or we've never done it that way before because you feel the emotional stakes higher. You care about the people. You care about your family. And, and so you more uh, likely go back to um, your automatic responses. With Oftentimes, your automatic responses are one of two ways. Um, if you lean on the side of self-definition, -def um, then you're likely to get reactive. That is, you're likely to get defensive or argumentative. Um, and that... And you don't want that. You don't want to automatically do that. You, you want to be able to regulate yourself and maintain a non-anxious presence. At the other end of the spectrum um, is to be adaptive. If you lean on the side of emotional connection um, and, and caring what other people think, then you're more likely to be what's called adaptive and just give in and not really say what you believe, not really self-define. And that's not helpful either, especially as a leader, because as a leader, people want you to want to know what you think. They want to know what you believe even if they don't agree with you. One of the things that makes this tough is what's called the leverage of the dependent. Dependent people are people who say, well, if you don't do what I say, you don't care about me. Um, or uh, we, we need you to do this because uh, this is, we're all gonna be upset if you don't. In other words, they're depending on you to meet their emotional needs. And that type of dependency uh, can keep uh, any relationship stuck. Uh, when when the dependent uh, are are saying to you that you you need to behave a certain way, or they're going to be upset, um, they're not going to have their needs met. Um, they're gonna they're gonna try to put you in a bind that makes it really difficult. And so as long as you're trying to convince them, oh that no no, don't worry, you 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 just need to agree because. Um, uh, we're 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 going to be okay, and 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 you don't you won't move forward until they come to an agreement. Then you're stuck. They have the leverage on you. On the other hand, if you say to them, and I'll get I'll get to you in a minute, Bill. If you say to them, um, "Hey, I, I get you're worried about this. I get your concern. Um, I really do believe uh, God is calling us in this direction, and and it may not work, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. I may be wrong, but that's." But I, this is what I believe. And if you don't agree, that's OK. Uh, but I think we should move forward. And, and so that's what a non-anxious leader is able to do. And as soon as that happens, what happens is the, the dependent ones, they no longer have the leverage because then they're trying to convince you to stop instead of you trying to convince them to go, if, that, if, that, if, that, if you get that analogy. So uh, as long as you're trying to con uh, convince the dependent, the stuck ones, the resistant ones to go, go along with you, they've got the leverage, you're stuck. As soon as you uh, say, you know what, that's okay, and they have to convince you to stop, um, then it opens up the possibility for change. Uh, Bill, you got a question? As soon as I unmute, we've got, well, we've got a statement and then a question. Okay. And so if you could just reflect on the statement, one of our participants writes, doesn't this go back to Micah 6, 8, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. This works as a follower of Jesus and also as a leader of followers of Jesus. So how does, how does what you're talking about relate to that Micah 6, 8 passage that our participant lifts up? Well, so um, it, this is uh, uh, this has a lot to do with the self-definition of part of it, um, you know, um, and, and also the emotional kindness. So the act justly part um, if we think of justice in terms of what's right, we're, we're thinking about where is God leading us to help make things right, uh, to point to the reign of God in the world. Um, to, to love kindness is, is to 
show emotional connection, right, uh, to others, even those who disagree, and to walk humbly is to be able to embrace that vulnerability and know you might not be right. It's okay. So, um, so I, I, I would agree. Um, I think anybody who seeks to live by uh, Micah six eight is uh, never going to go wrong. The problem is, people get anxious. People fear change, and and so they resist. And that's that's what gets any relationship stuck, whether it's a family of origin, a congregation, an organization, or even a denomination. All right, and, and then we do have a question that's come in. Should the leader, I'll do my air quotes, quote, test the belief with a trusted few? Oh, absolutely. It never, it never hurts um, to do that. Uh, one of the things I've found is, um, especially if, uh, if you trust them spiritually, uh, I, I always kind of look to the people that I know are um, really connected to God, because oftentimes, e even if I don't hear God, I know they do. And so um, you, you testing it out by saying, you know, I believe God is calling us in this direction. Um, you're going to get either confirmation or you're going to get something that tells you maybe I need to rethink this. And because I, the, what I've seen is the way the Holy Spirit works, if, if this is really God's calling, um, at least one or two or maybe more will say, you know, God's been nudging me the same way. And before you know it, you have a critical mass of people who are spiritually grounded, spiritually mature. And, and as soon as you have a critical mass of, of, of those types of people, uh, you have an opportunity to lead change. That doesn't mean that, that there will be, won't be people who will be anxious and resistant. Uh, but the more people who are spiritually grounded and mature, uh, who are seeing that same leading, uh, the, better, the better off you are. All right. I, as I like to say, carry on. Thank you, Jack. All right. Thank you. Okay. So one of the concepts of uh, family systems theory is the concept of a triangle. Um, and a triangle occurs when two people become uncomfortable in their relationship with each other, and they focus on a third person or issue to stabilize it. So uh, a, an example might be this, this happens a lot in couples relationships. Uh, couples uh, are not, you know, they're just not as comfortable with each other, not as open and vulnerable as each other as they could be. And, and so one of the ways that a triangle can occur is one of the members of the couple focuses on their work. They dive into their work. They get um, even obsessed with their work. Um, well, what happens then? And that, that's kind of in a way to avoid, right? A way uh, to avoid dealing with the discomfort in the relationship with the other member of the couple. But what happens? The other member of the couple um, starts getting uncomfortable with the amount of hours that are being spent or the obsession and, and starts maybe complaining, you're working too much. Uh, well, my boss tells me I have to. Um, you know, why, did, why aren't you home earlier? Well, I'm, my career is really important. And, and so all of a sudden they start focusing on the work and um, the, that, that actually becomes uh, the focus of all their conflict, the focus of their energy, and it enables them to avoid dealing with each other. So um, another triangle that is a classic triangle is substance abuse. Uh, substance abuse is when uh, the abuser, the user, um, is uncomfortable with one or more uh, relationships in their family of origin. And so they start using, they start abusing substances. Uh, well, what happens? The family starts focusing on the abuse. Uh, they and they don't funk, focus on well. How am I enabling this abuse? Uh, in fact, that you know, Al-Anon. One of the things Al-Anon does is it helps people who are family members stop <laughs> trying to uh, focus on the abuse, stop trying to fix the abuser, and start focusing on how their own functioning and how they might set appropriate boundaries and how they might um, stop enabling uh, the other. So, um, why does this matter? Um, because Triangles are a function of a lack of self-differentiation. So that to the extent that we are self-differentiated, even when we are uncomfortable, we will deal with that discomfort and deal with the person, um, you know, that relationship that might be uncomfortable. Murray Bowen says um, that, that most people, Murray Bowen was the developer of family systems theory, most people <laughs> were, are going to be able to self-differentiate about a third of the time or less. 
um, and that um, a, an extraordinary amount would be able to self-differentiate 50% of the time, half the time. So what does that mean? It means <clears throat> when we are encountering uncomfortable relationships, uncomfortable, uncomfortable interactions, um, we don't self-differentiate at least half the time, maybe two thirds of the time. And if we're more uh, uh, on the reactive side, we get defensive, we get argumentative, um, uh, we withdraw emotionally. If we're on the um, adaptive side, we just give in and we don't say what we believe and neither are helpful. And so what happens when we self-differentiate um, less of the time is we then look to triangles to um, uh, uh, find a way to stabilize the relationship. Bowen says that the triangle is the most stable form of human relationship because people aren't very good at differentiating in uncomfortable situations. So in the church, this happens all the time. Um, when uh, a new initiative passes and we're going to start a new worship service or uh, we're going to start a new feeding ministry or whatever, people don't speak up because they're uncomfortable about it. And uh, they just let it happen. Um, and then uh, even though it starts to move forward, uh, they start complaining about the pastor's visitation, the amount of visitation, or they start complaining about the pastor's um, sermons, or they start complaining about um, uh, uh, you know, the, the speed of the hymns. It, 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 it's a way of avoiding their own discomfort. And people aren't doing that on purpose. Um, it's just they 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 aren't able to self differentiate, and so they're looking for another way to displace their discomfort. And the triangles are all over the place. They're in our families of origin, and they're in our congregations. And so, being able to recognize triangles helps you to understand that it's process, not content. So <clears throat> it's not. It's not the content of the situation. It's the emotional process that's going on. What is going on? Is somebody being reactive? Is somebody being adaptive? Or is somebody able to express themselves in a healthy way? And, and when you start to recognize the emotional process, it helps you to avoid getting in the into the content because when you get into the content with them, you get stuck. Uh, my, my best example is um, it, in my second appointment, first Christmas Eve, I was coming into the church for uh, the Christmas Eve service, and we had decided to do something radical. This was back in 1996. Uh, instead of the uh, uh, traditional service of lessons and carols, we were going to have uh, four young people all dressed in black on bar stools with music stands, reading a dramatic interpretation of the Christmas story. And when I say young people, I mean people in their 40s and 50s. So... I just thought this was great. You know, we're, we're going to be able to reach people who uh, maybe don't connect with uh, uh, the story about Jesus because they don't come to church very often. Uh, it'll be it'll be refreshing. It'll be new. Uh, well, as soon as I get into the church, this woman comes up to me and she is in my face saying, this is not a Christmas Eve service. I've never heard of such a thing. This is going to be a disaster. And and and. Whoa. You know, what do you do with that? Um, but I recognized there's an emotional process going on here that that um, if she were self-differentiated, she would come up to me and say, Pastor, um, I, I, I maybe I can see what you're trying to do or help me understand what you're trying to do or I don't understand what you're trying to do and I'm concerned about it. Um, they would be less anxious <clears throat> and less reactive. So uh, my training had told me and I think the Holy Spirit helped me to not Get into the content, not start trying to convince her. Um, well, this is we're going to try. We're going to reach people who um, <clears throat> aren't comfortable with churchy things or whatever. Um, but to, to just show that I care, show that I'm connected, um, and not um, not engage in the content. And so I, I I said to her, I think, like I said, I think the Holy Spirit gave me the words um, to just say, you know what. Um, I, I I can always count on you to tell me how you feel, and you know you know notice I didn't argue with her. I didn't get defensive. Um, I I was trying to show I care. Um, thank you for sharing is always a good way to do that as well. <clears throat> and I was able. She was just well, well. She wasn't real pleased by that. She goes well. well you're right about that. And she stomped off. Well, <clears throat> the the um, after the service, I went up to the lay leader and I asked. Uh, 
what's going on? Is she okay? Um, it seems like something's wrong. This seems a little bit out of character. And and um, the lay leader told me, well, two years ago, right around Christmas, her 23-year-old daughter died. <laughs> and so immediately I knew what was going on. She was grieving. And, and there was a triangle. The triangle was her grief and, and um, the Christmas Eve service. So she was uncomfortable with her grief over her daughter dying, which of course, um, you know, that, that that's hard. Um, <clears throat> and so what she was able to do is focus on the Christmas Eve service and take her anger and her, her um, you know, displeasure out on the Christmas Eve service. Uh, so what I was able to do is I was able to contact her um, after Christmas, a week after Christmas, um, and just asked to come over and visit. And when I went over, um, I just, you know, the first thing I mentioned was I, I heard about your daughter and I'm so sorry. And that's all we talked about. The Christmas Eve service never came up. Um, so by avoiding the content of the situation and understanding the emotional process, <clears throat> I was able to to really un- know what was going on with her. And, and <clears throat> excuse me, so many times when people are uh, responding in these ways to you, there are other things going on in their lives um, <clears throat> that have nothing to do with the content of the situation. And so recognizing the emotional process helps you to avoid getting into the content right away. Uh, now, sometimes people can say things uh, with a lot of emotionality and a lot of reactivity, and maybe they're right, and maybe you still want to hear that through that. But if you can avoid getting into the content right away, it can help you to think more clearly. So um, understanding that it's process and not content helps you to see uh, things with a different lens. And the way I like to describe that is, excuse me, when others are defining themselves and they're doing it in a healthy way, you know, pastor, I don't understand, or pastor, I'm concerned about this. Or pastor, um, I can't agree with you. Feel free to um, engage. Tell me more. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Take your time, Jack. Take your time. If we have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A as we give Jack a minute just to uh, catch his breath and get his voice back. All right, I'm going to try to go on. Excellent. It doesn't quite feel like my voice is here. I could run, get a lozenge, and um, let me go do that real quick. Okay. We get a lozenge. We'll talk amongst ourselves. All right. Thank you. I don't know what we're going to talk about, but um, please feel free to drop questions in the Q and A, and we'll get to them as soon as Jack returns. We'll also have an opportunity if you know if you th- think of something afterwards to be able to connect with with Jack. Uh, particularly if you're interested in taking his course and information about that is found on both of the conference um, websites so that you're able to take that when it's offered in March. We do have a question that's come in as soon as Jack comes back. So if you need to uh, uh, stand up and stretch, Jack, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, Somebody would like to know, how long did it take you to develop a non-anxious presence as a pastor? Um, forever. <laughs> no. um, I, it's a work in process. Uh, like I said, um, if you think that, if you understand that it's going to be hard to self-differentiate even a third of the time, um, especially half of the, half the time, then um, you give yourself a break when you don't. If you get upset and you respond in a way you don't want to, or if you just give in and you don't, um, uh, you don't speak up in the way you want to. Um, the, what uh, Bill uh, Selby, who uh, founded the Center for Pastoral Effectiveness in the Rockies, who teaches this, um, <clears throat> he says a sentence always ends with a comma, not a period. And that means that um, it's never the end of the conversation. You can always come back and revisit. And, and so I would say that I recognized what that looked like pretty early. Um, and over time, I got better at doing it. And so um, 
what, what you want to be able to do is first understand the principles and then be able to um, pause in the moment. There's a concept uh, called self-regulation um, in emotional intelligence. I call it pausing, <clears throat> where you um, create a gap between the stimulus and the response. Um, Stephen Covey talks about creating space between stimulus and response because <clears throat> our automatic responses actually come from the primitive part of our brain. So if we're wired to fight back or if we're wired to just give in, that's what's going to happen automatically in anxious situations. And, and what you want to learn to do first is to just pause, just self-regulate and allow your brain to catch up with the automatic response, not say anything. And this is, will be uncomfortable at first, <clears throat> but if you can practice that, you'll get better at that. And the better you get at that, the better you give yourself a chance to think and say, okay, what's going on here? Um, how would I like to respond? And, um, and then to try to do it. And again, uh, if you could do this half the time, you would be an extraordinarily non-anxious presence. It's, it's okay that we're, we don't do it all the time. And, and so what I like to say, this is kind of a you know, cliche, but this is simple to understand. It's hard to do. Um, but just understanding it gives you, gives you a chance. And being able to create that space uh, in your response is really important. I, you know, I would add to that, Jack, that it's a very intentional decision mm -hmm. with every conversation. And when you do, when you're not successful at it or get it wrong or however you want to define that, when you become that anxious presence or that non-anxious non-presence, as you describe it, it's, it's kind of dissecting the conversation and then learning from it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think what at least for most of us and, and me, I, I, this is something I had to work against is we feel like we have to respond right away. Mm -hmm. um, we're uncomfortable with silence. Um, but but being able to just be thoughtful, um, I think people appreciate that, you know, that you don't just spurt something right back out or give in right away that, that um, you're thoughtful. And so <clears throat> the, the, the better you get at um, creating a pause and getting comfortable with the pause, the better chance you have. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just say a plug for the course. That's what the course is about, is helping you to learn all about that and how to do that. So, so this is just a <laughs> teaser. Sign up if you want to know more. We do have someone who's asked the question. Um, they write, I see the value of being empathetic and being emotionally connected, but should part of the process involve having conversations explaining the reason reason why or informing folks how you plan to get to where you're going. So <clears throat> that goes directly to this slide. Um, you can you can uh, you can do that in general. Make sure you let let people know this is what I believe. This is where I think we're heading. This is why all of that. Um, and then for those who are um, <clears throat> self-differentiating, they're explaining uh, things, asking things in a healthy way, even if they disagree. Get into a conversation, dig in with them, ask them why they why they disagree or what's going on, um, <clears throat> because you're going to learn things that will help you. Uh, but when they are defining others, especially you, you you're leading us down the wrong path. You're going to destroy the church. Um, when they're being reactive, when they're being highly emotional, there's usually something else going on, and that's why you, that's when you want to. Avoid the content of the situation, even while you're moving closer, even while you're uh, trying to connect. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, I, I really do care about what you think. Um, and and I'll get into this in the course. But one of the things you can do is just listen. Um, just ask questions. Let them let them vent. Let them go to town. You're not then arguing who's right and who's wrong. <clears throat> you're not trying to convince them to agree with you. You're just listening. And oftentimes, just listening, especially with open-ended questions, <clears throat> reduces the emotionality, reduces the intensity and the anxiety in the situation. So um, I use this guideline because <clears throat> I don't think you want to try to uh, convince an anxious person, well, this is why we're doing it. And this is um, these are the uh, things behind it. Because <clears throat> if you've ever been in a discussion with somebody like that, you, you, you can't win. Um, they're going to you know, they, they'll find every way to disagree with you. And so 
um, <clears throat> this actually sets up the next thing, which is um, this concept of a conflict of wills, which uh, I mentioned the research shows that when, when you try to convince somebody to agree with you, uh, it actually has the opposite effect. And <clears throat> so what we want to do is avoid that conflict of wills. We want to avoid getting into the content and trying to convince somebody else they have to agree with us. That comes from our own need to be right and possibly the need of the other person to be right. Uh, it results in the opposite. Um, res uh, it you know, results in the opposite. They're, they're just going to push back <clears throat> and be more firm in their position and their disagreement. And so one way to look at this is don't argue, don't agree. Okay, don't get into that conflict of wills with them. Don't give in either. But just show you care. And like I said, listening is a good way to do that. Um, being able to just be present with them in a way that shows you care. One of the things that I'll do sometimes is after listening for a while, I want to get I want to get to really what's going on with them. In fact, uh, when I work with people and they're they, they're talking about somebody who's being real anxious and disruptive, the first question I'll ask is what's going on in their family of origin? And I'll usually find out oh, well, they have a spouse who's terminally ill, or they just retired, which is a huge transition, or they, um, <clears throat> now, now they're empty nesters, and, or you know, they're, they're, they're having a conflict with their sibling, and, and you find out, okay, there's something else really going on. And so when, when somebody is in that situation, if I can just listen for a while, not argue, not agree, uh, at some point, if I can get to the point of saying, oh, well, you know, enough about that. Um, Tell me, how are you doing otherwise? Uh, oftentimes, they will open right up because they're already, you know, they're they're already primed to to let loose of it somehow, and they've focused on this triangle, this thing that really isn't the issue for them, and and it gives them an opportunity to to share. And what you will find when you actually work with people in that way, you don't argue, you don't agree, you stay connected, you move closer to them. Um, that, and you help them through their difficult times, they actually become big supporters of whatever you're trying to lead because they really weren't against it to begin with. They were dealing with their own discomfort in some uh, other uh, way. Now, some people are uncomfortable with the change itself, but what they tend to do is not focus on the change. What they tend to do is focus on something else, like I said, like the pastor's preaching or the speed of the hymns or whatever. Um, and, and again, if you get into the content with them, you get stuck because, uh, what they're really uncomfortable with is the change. And, and what, what you want to do is just stay connected to, with them, show, show that you care. Um, uh, so I have an ex example, uh, because this, this is what's called sabotage when, when, um, you, when, when people are uncomfortable with change, uh, what they will tend to do is they will tend to then disrupt things in a way uh, that, that it doesn't really have anything to do with the change, but it, it sidetracks the, the leader. Um, a, a good personal example of this is, uh, this is not my own example, but an example of kind of in someone's personal life is let's say a person decides they're gonna exercise, they wanna get healthy. And, and so they start doing that and they're exercising and they're doing really well and they're feeling really good about it. It's become a habit for them. Um, but for some reason, their, their father is uncomfortable with that. And, um, you know, this is what happens, right? I don't know why it happens, but people are uncomfortable with change. Um, and so they sabotage and they don't do it wittingly, but they're uncomfortable. They want, they want things to go back to the way they, they are. And so what does, what does the father do? Well, you know, your brother's spouse, <laughs> you need to talk to them. They are getting out of hand. You need to talk to your brother, tell your brother to take care of it. Well, what does that do? That makes you feel anxious. I don't want to talk to my brother. That's his problem, you know, but but you're getting this sort of grounding together in this pressure. You, there's this triangle being created. And what does it do? It creates anxiety in you. <clears throat> it makes it less likely you're going to um, uh, exercise. You get thrown off for a couple of days. All of a sudden, your habits get broken um, and things go back to the way they are. And that's that's really what sabotage is when when you are trying to lead change, um, there, there are ways that uh, people try, try to focus on something that sidetracks the leadership. And so the, the best thing you can do is stay connected to those people without getting into trying to convince them, well, you know, uh, I, I, like if I'm a pastor, 
look at how many hours I visit. Da, 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 da. You know, um, if if you can just share with them, I hear what you're saying. Um, I'm doing the best I can, um, and I'm, I'm going to keep working on that. Um, uh, so it, you, that allows you to stay focused on the change you're trying to lead, because it is in um, it, in that discomfort that they have that they're going to focus on something and try to sidetrack the change. And the reason that is, is all change is loss. Um, anytime there is a, a change, um, it's the loss of the old. And, and I think we get that, you know, when somebody loses a, a loved one, that's a loss, or they lose a job, <clears throat> or um, they have to retire, that's a loss of a career. But, you know, it, even positive um, changes are losses. So when somebody gets married, that's the loss of singleness. When somebody has a baby, that's the loss of freedom. <laughs> when um, <clears throat> somebody changes, gets a promotion, that's a loss of the old job. And so all change is loss. And with loss comes grief. And and until people are able to recognize um, their own grief over the loss, uh, uh, helping people to, to live into that and work through it, um, there, it, it's going to be hard for them to live into the change. And so with loss comes grief, but with grief comes a possibility for growth. When, when people actually lean into the grief process, they get stronger, they get more resilient. And so one of the things you do as a leader by maintaining, maintaining a non-anxious presence is, is you don't alleviate other people's um, pain for them. <laughs> you walk alongside them, you show you care but you give them the opportunity to work through their own grief and to get stronger and more resilient. And I've seen this happen over and over again. When a leader or leaders do this, <clears throat> it, it tips a whole relationship system, a whole congregation uh, to, be, to being more open to change and more resilient and more adaptive. And that's something I think we all would like to see from our churches nowadays. So <clears throat> how, do you, how can you respond then to these anxious situations, anxious stories. How can you <coughs> um, deal with the sabotage? <coughs> and what family systems theory uh, uses is this concept of paradox and playfulness. Paradox is leaning in the other direction. Um, it's, uh, Friedman describes it as turning the wheels uh, into the skid. It's, it's doing the opposite of what you would think is right. I have a couple of stories to illustrate this. Um, I teach a course uh, every uh, summer <clears throat> to be a disciple that's very similar to the course we're offering uh, through our uh, the Center for Vital Leadership. And there was a pastor in this course in 2020, summer of 2020, and, <clears throat> you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And he was saying that 25 families left the church uh, because they had decided not to go back to Sunday school in person. They had already gone back to, to in-person worship, and that, that was pretty early for a lot of churches. Um, so <clears throat> they, they uh, had done that, and uh, because they, they, there wasn't Sunday school for the kids, 25 families left the church. And he said, what do I do? I said, move closer to each one of them. Call each one of them and just tell them, okay, um, look, I care about you. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. If you want to choose this, that's fine. Um, that's your choice. If you go, you go with my blessings. <clears throat> but just know there's, there's, you're always going to be welcome back. Okay, that's the opposite of saying, you know, please come back. Begging, begging is never attractive. Or, <clears throat> you know, well, you need to understand. This is why we decided that we we can't. We've got to keep our kids safe. You know, you're getting into the content of the situation. Paradox just gives the responsibility of choice back to the other. And what this pastor found very quickly was that each of, each of the people he called said, "Oh, don't worry, we'll we'll be back. Soon. We'll be back as soon as um, we're, we have Sunday school again. We'll be back." But um, we're just kind of supporting so and so. And so so and so was the ringleader of these twenty five families, and come to find out that the ringleader had uh, both of the the, uh, the couple had lost their jobs. <clears throat> they lo uh, lost a family member to COVID. They were. They were in deep pain. And what were they doing? They were triangling. They were focusing their anger on the fact that, that they were not going back uh, to Sunday school in person in the church. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, he, 
it, the pastor didn't try to convince them to come back. Just said, you know, uh, it's uh, I understand. I care about you, and tried to walk alongside them. I never really uh, heard how that uh, story finished because we were only together for four weeks. <clears throat> but just the good news, and that was that by staying connected to most most of those families, were going to come back. And so that's paradox. Um, another another example of paradox. Uh, when I was being taken in uh, as a new pastor in a congregation, um, uh, the uh, the district superintendent said to the uh, staff parish relations committee, um, <clears throat> I think you need to know that your new pastor has an earring. Uh, this was back in the 90s, so um, I guess it was a little bit more radical then. Um, and and one of the members of the SPRC said, well, I'm, I, we're not going to put up with this. I'm not going to have this. If that happens, I'm leaving. I'm going to another church. And one of the women in the S in the SBRC, I wasn't there, but they told me about this, turned and looked at her and said, "Well, we'll miss you." That's paradox, right? You're when people give you an ultimatum, you give them the freedom to choose. You you call their bluff. You say, "Okay." And notice how that was still being emotionally connected. It will miss you means we care about you, but you have to make your choice. Um, the other part of that is that was a little bit playful, right? Um, you know, every time I hear that story, I laugh. And any, anytime somebody who was in that room tells a story, they laugh. And though, of course, the woman didn't leave. She she just, you know, <clears throat> I don't I don't think she said anything after that. But <clears throat> playfulness is an antidote to seriousness. It allows you um, to bring the anxiety level in the room down. And, and what I say is, <clears throat> if you if it comes across as sarcasm, don't do it. But if you can, if you can be playful in the moment, it actually helps everybody be less anxious. Uh, Friedman, in his book Generation to Generation, talks about a, a rabbi who goes into a Sunday school, and they did call it Sunday school, and it was the day of a big uh, congregational uh, celebration in the synagogue, and um, so everybody was kind of on edge, and there were several parents who were up in arms because a ten-year-old boy had written in Hebrew letters the, the, uh, the slang for feces. And, and you know, they were like, oh, we have to do something about this. And, and the, the rabbi immediately knew this was a triangle. They were, they were anxious about the, uh, the congregational celebration, and they're focusing on the kid. And so what did the, what did the rabbi say? Well, the rabbi noticed that actually um, the, the Child, the boy had spelled the word incorrectly, and in that if you pronounced it, you would pronounce it shite. And so the rabbi said, Young man, you've gotten this entirely wrong. I want you to write this correctly 100 times. And all the all the leaders laughed, all the anxiety came down, and they were able to move forward. Uh, one last story. This is a personal story. <clears throat> um, we were we were at lunch one day after church. It was my uh wife and three of our four kids and it was a beautiful day it was a, a fall day we were at, at a restaurant outside in the sun uh, looking out at a river and uh we it just felt really good and you know we'd been there for 20 30 minutes and my wife just said we have the best family in the world and we all are like yeah this is great you know well not 10 minutes later or so my two sons they're uh they're four years apart, and they just started arguing about mortgages. And the older one had worked in the mortgage industry. The, <clears throat> the younger one was working in the mortgage industry. And, and I, I don't even know what they were arguing about. But, you know, it, things got more tense and more uncomfortable and more uncomfortable. And finally, one of them said, you, you're not hearing what I'm saying. And then there was this silence. I mean, just really uncomfortable, really anxious. And again, I think God gave me the words to say, and, and I just said, well, we used to have the best family in the world, which is playful, right? I mean, because should I try to get them to, to get along? If I try to tell them they have to get along, I'm creating a triangle. I'm getting involved in trying to fix their relationship, <clears throat> which is not anything we can ever do. The only person we can change is ourselves. So <clears throat> what, what um, playfulness does is it helps us to when we recognize triangles, to stay out of the triangles, to bring everybody's anxiety level down. They didn't really care. They were arguing about nothing. They were just doing what brothers do. And we just weren't used to it because they're adults now. And so being able to look at situations and understand the process going, that's going on helps us to remain more non-anxious. Now, 
how do you really work through this and <clears throat> get to the point where you can, you can be more of a non-anxious presence? Um, what they say in family systems theory, it's doing your own work. This is called a genogram. A genogram is like a family tree, but it shows uh, relationships lines. Um, and this is, I guess, Luke Skywalker's uh, family tree. I don't know much about Star Wars, but I just thought it was a cool diagram. <clears throat> Green is uh, closeness, so he's really close to Han Solo. Um, jagged lines are conflictual. Um, dotted lines are distance. And, and this shows when you start to work through your family of origin, you start to figure out which relationships cause you the most anxiety. And then it's in those relationships, if you can rework them to where you can become more self-differentiated, <clears throat> you are able to actually then self-differentiate in other situations. And, and this is this is a work that takes place. Um, it's not easy work, uh, but it's work worth doing. And, and <clears throat> one way I can uh, always tell uh, so, who, where there are anxious relationships is if there is somebody in your family of origin or if there's somebody in your congregation that whenever <laughs> you see a, a text message or a voicemail or an email from them, your blood pressure shoots up, then that's a relationship where you want to focus and try to rework it, especially in your family of origin, because it, <clears throat> families, you know, are probably the most flexible and, and welcoming and <clears throat> supportive, even when they're not, but they, they tend to not give up on us. And yet we feel the stakes are highest in our family of origin. So if if you can rework that relationship with that family member where, um, you know, if you're used to giving in, you can stand up here with, to them and say, you know, <clears throat> I really care what you think, but I'm going to do it this way this time. Um, and then maintain connection with them when they start to sabotage and act up. Or if you normally react to them and you can self-regulate um, <clears throat> and not get defensive and just show them that you care without uh, and without trying to get them to agree with you, you're reworking how you deal with the most difficult relationships in your own family of origin. And when you can do that, <clears throat> you will make progress as a non-anxious presence and a non-anxious leader. And that leads to my last slide, which is uh, Soren Kierkegaard's quote, which is my favorite. It, <clears throat> I think it really helps us to understand uh, what, what family systems theory can help us do. It helps, it opens our, ourselves up so that God can enable us to become the person that God calls us to be. Uh, so two more plugs. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, um, uh, the URL for um, <clears throat> the course that's being offered for, for, uh, through the Center for Vital Leadership. And um, <clears throat> in a minute, I could try to drop it in the chat as well, uh, Bill. Um, it's called the Non-Anxious Leader Family Systems Basics. It's a four-week course, starts March 6th. Um, it's videos and um, audios, and uh, uh, you're you're asked to read a book um, that I wrote on called Anxious Church, Anxious People. Um, <clears throat> you'll get a free copy of it in there, so a digital copy, um, so you don't even have to buy the book. Uh, and and we'll work through that over four weeks. There'll be four live sessions every Thursday night at 5 p.m. Um, those sessions will be recorded, so if you can't make them live, um, uh, you can watch a recording. But that's where uh, we'll go through case studies and answer questions and things like that. And, and final plug. <laughs> uh, so if you're really interested in family system theory, um, Anxious Church, Anxious People, How to Lead Change in an Age of Anxiety is uh, the book I wrote specifically on this topic. Um, if You Met My Family, You'd Understand is based um, is more general towards family systems theory. And then I have a podcast, a non-anxious leader podcast uh, with yeah, typically 15 minute episodes every week where we... Um, where I, I try to look at leadership through the family systems lens. And uh, you can find out all about that at the nonanxiousleader.com. That's my plug. I'm done with that. All righty, Jack. Thank you so much. You know, there we go. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight, Jack, and for the questions that have come in. I know it is a lot to process for people. So please, if you want to know more, if you're curious, if you just want to learn how to be a better leader in what I would say is a very different approach to leadership than you will get anywhere else, um, any other leadership course you choose to take, which there's a lot of good ones out there, but this is a very different take on leadership and how to manage change 
And it's one that I think um, has some extremely positive and helpful results. So thank you for introducing us to this tonight, Jack. And uh, want to have everyone take the opportunity to sign up for the course. So he's dropped the link to the registration. And is there a limit to how many people can participate? No, we have not put a limit on it. So Wonderful. Um, Wonderful. So sign up today. It's going to be starting in a couple of weeks. And with that, Jack, we're going to say goodnight to everybody. We'll have another Training Tuesday, we think in March. So stay tuned. Uh, the topic is being developed even as we speak. But it will be one that uh, I know will be very important and one that people are asking. We'll ask a lot of questions about. So join us when you see the advertisements for our next Training Tuesday in March. But until then, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Have a very um, blessed Ash Wednesday observance tomorrow as we begin to enter the season of Lent to prepare ourselves for the great feast and celebration of Easter and then our work as disciples of Jesus Christ. So once again, thank you, Jack, and thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Uh, good night and God bless you all.